one of the most overlooked accessories in gaming is mouse pads. Over the years, mouse pads haven't only gotten larger, but companies have started making them with new materials. And as esports have become more popular, players have started to discover that certain pads actually suit their playstyles, or even their games, better than others. So how did mouse pads come to be? And how do they differ? It sometimes feels as if there's hundreds of options out there for us gamers. So how do you know which one is supposed to suit you? Well, let's find out. So back in 1968, there was an engineer by the name of Douglas Engelbart who held a conference in San Francisco that is now referred to as the mother of all demos. Initially, everyone expected to listen to my boy Douglas talk about the research that he conducted at his Augmentation Research Center at Stanford. But instead of just talking about it, he surprised everyone by actually showing them a demo. Now, this demo didn't just feature some old ass computer and keyboard. No, this marked the very first time that a mouse was actually shown to the public. There's Don Andrew's hand in Menlo Park, and in a second we'll see the screen that he's working, and the way the tracking spot moves in conjunction with movements of that mouse. I don't know why we call it a mouse, sometimes I apologize, it started that way, and we never did change it. So it's safe to say that the homie Doug blew a couple of minds that day. You just blew my f***ing mind. But there was still one thing missing from his setup. Douglas needed a mouse pad. Now, luckily for him, Herman Miller designer Jack Kelly designed the first mouse pad just one year later in 1969, and from then on, everyone started using them. Over the course of the 1970s, ball mice dominated the market, so anyone who had a computer and a mouse usually opted to use a soft mouse pad alongside it. But as the 80s rolled around, optical mice became increasingly popular. And because of their use of image sensors to track motion, mouse pads weren't exactly required. The only problem with optical mice is that they can't be used on reflective or transparent surfaces like glass. So depending on your setup, pads were sometimes a must. Luckily, in the late 90s, this problem was solved with the release of laser mice, which perform much better on said surfaces. So at that point, you didn't really need a mouse pad. Until people started to game. As PC gaming became more mainstream in the early 2000s, Counter-Strike competitors in particular were still having issues with their generic mouse pads. Since normal pads require cleaning in order to give you consistent control over your mouse, SteelSeries eventually saved the FPS world in 2001 with a glass pad called the Ice Mat, and later the ever-goated QCK. But a new generation of mice demanded a new kind of mouse pad. We tested 751 surfaces to create QCK a combination of microwoven cloth and natural rubber that gives you flawless mouse control and all-day comfort. While FPS games like Quake and Counter-Strike dominated the market in Europe and the Americas, RTS esports, i.e. StarCraft, became massive in South Korea. As StarCraft's esports scene continued to grow in popularity, many competitors began rocking higher DPIs because gaming-branded mice supported them. And since a lot of pros were using above-average DPIs, small mouse pads were standard fare back then. But as TAC FPSs like Counter-Strike grew more and more, larger pads became more popular. Due to the slow and methodical nature of Counter-Strike, many competitors gravitated towards lower sensitivities. And since you're physically required to move your mouse long distances on low sensitivity, it made sense that competitors wanted bigger pads. Rather than just using small wrist movements to control their cursors, many players began placing their entire elbows on their desks in order to better control their movements. And naturally, the mouse pad market was forced to cater to them. Nowadays, almost every popular mouse pad is available in a variety of different sizes. 
So depending on your sensitivity, the possibilities are endless. Hell, you can even get pads that cover your entire desk if you want. But over time, it wasn't just the shape and size that was changing. It was the materials that were being used to produce these pads. Here's the thing though, I am a boomer who uses a boomer pad and I don't know anything about this carbon fiber glass business. So I'm gonna ask my good friend Colton to come in and do all the research on the zoomer pads and teach us about them. And now the guy who actually knows what he's talking about. So I've got good news and bad news. The bad news first, well, we're gonna be breaking out that physics textbook from a few episodes ago. The good news? Well, at least I think physics is cool, so sucks to suck. No, the real good news is that it's high school physics, so most of you should be just fine. Why physics? Well, at the heart of the mouse pad discussion is the coefficient of friction, and understanding this concept can actually help you better understand your choices of mouse pad material. There are two pieces to the coefficient of friction. Static friction, which refers to the amount of force required to take an object, like a mouse, from stationary to moving. That force is always higher than the second half, kinetic friction, which is the amount of resistance between your mouse pad and mouse while it's already in motion. As you already know, different surfaces are gonna give you different friction values, which make it easier or harder to move your mouse around. But that begs the obvious question, wouldn't you just wanna make this number as low as possible? Well, as the kids on the Magic School Bus discovered, we do need at least some friction to make controlled motion. How much though is mostly up to you. Whether it's microfiber or leather with all manner of different core materials, all the way up to solid mouse pads made out of glass or even wood, you can get as custom as you or your wallet are willing to get. Am I simplifying the science a fair bit here? Yes. But if you're curious about actually measuring the static friction of your mouse pad, then you're gonna need a little trigonometry and I'm not trying to scare anyone away with that shit. And the sine of theta over cosine theta equals tangent theta. Therefore, the coefficient of static friction between the book and the incline is equal to the tangent of the incline angle right before the book starts to slide. And the mouse pad is actually only half of the equation, but I'm gonna let Dimitri deal with mouse skates. And at the end of the day, how easy your mouse pad is to move across isn't even the only factor you wanna worry about. You are eventually going to have to clean the thing, and the softer, more porous pads will prove much more challenging in that regard. So you, yes, you, sitting at your desk right now with a crumbly snack in your hand, stop eating at your desk like some kind of wild animal, please. And that was the guy who actually knows what he's talking about. Because you can buy mice that weigh virtually nothing, or ones with, you know, modular weight additions, you can find one that feels exactly the way you want it to. On top of that, the mouse skate market has gone absolutely nuclear over the past few years. For a long time, most mice typically shipped with Teflon mouse skates. But if you give any sort of shit about gaming peripherals, then there's a very good chance that you've at least heard of glass mouse skates. Aftermarket skates have become insanely popular, and they too can give you a much faster feel than traditional Teflon skates, at the expense of some control and stopping power. As you can see, I'm having a pretty rough time here. I mean, aim is seriously just all over the place, and it looks like my first time ever playing with a gaming mouse. When I say that there is absolutely zero stopping power or friction on these things, I really, really mean it. In fact, the only way that I'm able to control and stop the mouse is by using my hand contact with the mouse pad itself. So aiming scenarios where you need to flick and stop on a small target, they feel almost impossible because I'm so used to having that feedback and traction from the mouse pad and helping me stop on that target. All right, so now that you know the history of mouse pads and have some rough idea of what all the different kinds do, it's time that we got to that pressing question. What kind do the pros use? Well, although there isn't one singular god pad that every top competitor is rocking, there are some very popular options out there that many of your favorite players do in fact swear by. If you are a CS stan like myself, then you've definitely at least heard of the Logitech G640 and of course the Zowie GSR, which I use. Both of which are solid control pads that are great for slower paced games like tack shooters. 
but I wouldn't necessarily recommend them if you're into battle royales or arena shooters where you often rely on a lot of tracking. The glorious fire pad is also a good option, but it is slightly smaller. So if you play on low sends, then it might not be the best option for you. One last notable mention has to go to the Steel Series QCK though, which we did mention earlier in the video. Although the first iteration of this thing came out nearly 20 years ago, it is still one of the most popular mouse pads used by pros across multiple esports. Lastly, I want to talk briefly about artisan pads. Although they have a pretty high price tag, these mouse pads are some of the highest quality products you will ever see. They don't wear out nearly as fast as other pads, so you won't have to clean them as often. And whether you're looking for a fast pad or a control pad, they have options for anyone. Niall actually did a review on his Artisan Heian last month, so make sure to check that out if you haven't already. Mouse pads may seem kind of simple, but they're actually really sophisticated, and they've come a long way. From the original rubber pads used with ball mice, to glass pads, to these new artisan things, the possibilities are endless. Hell, even if you don't care about the feel of it and you just want an RGB wireless charging one, then you might even sacrifice performance just to fit a certain aesthetic. Do you want an anime-inspired mouse pad? Certainly wouldn't be my first choice, but hey, do you, my dude? There are some pretty wild options out there if you don't especially care about the quality of the pad. And look, it can take a lot of time to stumble upon your personal favorite mouse pad. But when you do, it is a great feeling. And it will actually make a way bigger difference than you think. Throughout the 1970s, ball mice di Throughout the... <laughs> it's like I'm so great about saying ball mice now. <laughs> Throughout the 70s, ball mice dominated... <laughs> I can't say ball mice. <laughs> this is so <laughs> Throughout the 70s... <laughs> I gotta get through it, dude. Throughout the 70s... <laughs> I can't do this. Alright, sip of water and then we plow, plow, we plow this line. Oh, it's been a long f***ing day, alright.